Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast. Any sample, any time. The benefits of single reaction chamber microwave digestion for trace element analysis. I'm Laura Bush, the editorial director of Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this web seminar presented by Spectroscopy and sponsored by Milestone. Since 1988, Milestone has been at the forefront of microwave digestion, innovation, safety, performance, and technology. These decades of experience have led to the development of some of the most intelligent and most powerful microwave digestion systems on the market today. With over 30 patents and more than 20,000 instruments installed worldwide, covering large and small research institutions, as well as universities and industrial laboratories, Milestone is an acknowledged industry leader in microwave technology. For more information, please visit milestonesci.com. We have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. First, the webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, which you can find on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of your window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the webcast. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing today's presentation, please click on the question mark Health widget in the dock at the bottom of your window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are very pleased to be joined today by Robert Thomas and Laura Thompson. Robert J. Thomas has worked in the field of trace element analysis for more than 40 years, including 24 years for an ICPMS manufacturer and 17 years as a principal of his own consulting company. He has served on the American Chemical Society's Reagent Chemical Committee for the past 17 years as a leader of the Elemental Impurities Task Force, where he has worked closely with the United States Pharmacopeia to align heavy metal testing procedures in reagent chemicals with those of pharmaceutical materials. He has offered more than 80 publications on the fundamental principles and applications of plasma spectrochemical and sample preparation techniques. In addition, he has written three textbooks on trace element analysis, including a new book that focuses on the new global directives on elemental impurities in pharmaceutical and related materials. He is currently the editor and frequent contributor to the Atomic Perspectives column in Spectroscopy Magazine. He has an advanced degree in analytical chemistry from the University of Wales in the UK and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and a chartered chemist. Laura Thompson is the national sales manager for Milestone. She manages a technical sales force that is focused on solutions for analytical laboratories in a wide variety of markets. Milestone products include several offerings in microwave-assisted digestion, microwave-assisted extraction, clean chemistry, and direct mercury analysis. Laura obtained a master's degree in analytical chemistry from North Carolina State University, specializing in the application of atomic spectroscopy techniques. Prior to joining Milestone, she held positions that included a role as a global product management and application specialist with an analytical instrument company, as well as a role in laboratory management in a contract laboratory. Thank you both for joining us today. Laura, please get us started. Thank you, Laura, and hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this webcast. Today, we're going to focus on microwave sample preparation and how it fits into a trace metals lab. Regardless of the types of samples you are running, the end needs to be the same, quality data. How you analyze the sample is dependent solely on the instrumentation available in your lab. But before you can analyze anything, the sample must be prepared effectively. There are quite a few things you want to consider when preparing your sample. You want to minimize any contamination. This can come from the acid you're working with, your work area, the air in your room, anything your sample comes into contact with. You also want to reduce your handling steps. Every time you touch the sample, you're introducing some type of error. By minimizing your steps, you'll also reduce the chances of contamination. All of this will result in lowering the reagent blank contribution to your end measurement as well. Now let's focus on the one area in the middle, sample preparation. You have quite a few options from sample dilution, if your sample will allow for it, of course that would be the simplest way, all the way up to ashing, either by microwave means or conventional heating. 
we're actually going to focus this talk specifically on closed vessel microwave digestion. So you've decided on microwave digestion. How do you pick the correct microwave technology? First, you need to think about your sample type. How difficult are they to digest? And what types of acids will be required? Will these acids be correct for your elements of interest? And additionally, you need to understand what temperatures and the resulting pressures will be required for your digestion. Once you know the temperature and pressure needs, we can actually look at a comparison of the different microwave technologies. Here's a chart comparing three distinct technologies. First one on the left is the sequential system. Of course, it's sequential, so this allows for single sample digestions one at a time and offers limited temperature and pressure capability. Productivity category we would consider to be low simply because it has low temperature and pressure as well as the one sample at a time. The middle column is probably the one that most people are familiar with. This is called the rotor-based system. They're generally the workhorse of the lab, offering good temperature and pressure capability, good sample throughput, with medium productivity standard. A big step up from that category is actually where the SRC technology lies, offering maximum temperature and pressure capability, as well as maximum productivity for your sample preparation needs. And this is the area we want to focus on for the remainder of the webcast. Before we can focus on SRC, let's look at some of the limitations of rotor-based systems. It does require batching of similar matrices and chemistries. This is due to the control of power based on the reaction of one vessel at a time. Regardless of how you're measuring the temperature, it's still dictating the power based on one at a time. By batching, you prevent under-digestion of some samples due to the pressure and temperature resulting from another. Also, in these rotor-based systems, the materials are polymer-based, generally of Teflon, and as a result, you do have temperature and pressure limitations because of the material type. This is true for all rotor-based systems. The multiple components of vessels also require additional handling before and after digestion, which may cut into your productivity. Depending on your detection limit needs, the vessel liners may require extra cleaning between runs. What if we didn't have to worry about these issues and limitations? That takes us to SRC technology. First, I need to review how SRC works. So I want to tell you a little bit about how it differs from the rotor-based system. Instead of a rotor with discrete sample vessels, here you have your samples in vials with loose-fitting caps. You can see them in the center of the picture here. They're actually sitting in a rack that is lowered into a larger vessel containing a base load of acidified water. It's this base load that absorbs the microwave energy and transfers it to the vial. This allows every vial to react independently within the base load and ensures that all samples achieve maximum temperature with pressures contained up to 200 bar. This means no batching necessary. Any combination of sample type and acid chemistries can be run simultaneously in the SRC. As I mentioned, we do utilize loose spinning caps, so I want to talk about that. We are actually able to do this because we pre-pressurize the vessel with 40 bar of nitrogen prior to the start of the microwave program. This pre-pressurization acts as a gas cap and keeps all the vials independently closed. As the pressure builds, it's equalized both on the inside and outside of the vial. And because we do this, we can use a variety of vial types, including disposable glass, quartz, and Teflon, or any of these three in any combination. So just a further look at racks and vial types. There are a variety. Here you see our 15 position rack, and we also have the variety of vial types, as I mentioned before. You might need the Teflon if you're running HF. One thing to note here is that a minimum acid volume is not required in the SRC. This is excellent specifically when you're looking at lower detection limits or you're analyzing small sample sizes. So I know there may be some skeptics in the audience who are not convinced that the 40 bar of nitrogen actually caps the vessel. 
So I want to show you here the results of a study where vials containing 110 ppm of mercury, yes, I said 110 ppm, were placed right next to blank solution. We ran this rack in the ultra wave, just like we would normally do, pre-pressurized with 40 bar, and the results are given in the chart to the right. As you know, mercury is highly volatile, particularly when heated, and would contaminate any surrounding vessels if not capped tightly. You can see from the chart here, these are PPQ levels and are actually at the limit of detection for the instrument that they were run on. So you can rest assured that the SRC technology eliminates the worry of cross-contamination. Just to highlight a little bit more about the batching comparison, you see a couple of diagrams here. If you're looking at a rotor-based system and running multiple sample types, such as an API, a raw material, some packaging, and some capsules, they all have different temperature and pressure profiles. So you would really need to run these in separate rotors and separate runs. With the SRC technology, you can load all these samples at the same time in the same rack, running them simultaneously. This also allows for quicker method development if you need to work on a method, both on acid types and acid volumes and sample weights, you can run mixed, mixed um, versions of those ratios all at the same time to find the best method. So in summary, focusing on the SRC technology, it, is, it uniquely overcomes the limitations of all conventional microwave sample preparation systems, offering high performance, high sample throughput because of the no vessel assembly and fast cool down, you have improved workflow with no batching of samples, thereby reducing your labor costs, and you also have lower consumables costs by using disposable glass vials and fewer vial components as compared to vessels. SRC has found a place in a wide variety of market spaces, as indicated with the chart on the left, as well as unique features of SRC fit a range of markets. Additionally, many applications are represented, as you can see, from the chart to the right. Rob Thomas is now going to focus on some of these application areas. Rob? Okay, thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Milestone for inviting me to participate in this webinar today. My goal is to give you an overview of the ap application capabilities of SRC technology based on a combination of my work at the American Chemical Society and an assessment and evaluation of information in the public domain. So let's first give you a snapshot of my work with the ACS because I think it's particularly relevant to my talk today. The ACS publishes a handbook every five years of specifications and procedures for ACS-grade reagent chemicals that are used in general lab testing procedures. The book contains purity specifications, analytical methods, and guidelines for over 1,000 reagent chemicals and reference materials. For the past 17 years, I've served on the ACS Reagent Chemicals Committee, where I lead the Elemental Impurities Task Force. Our committee consists of approximately 25 people people, including users from various industries, including pharmaceutical, food, agriculture, and high-purity chemicals. It also includes chemical manufacturers, such as Thermo Fisher, Merck, Dow, and Honeywell, and also members of standards organizations, such as NIST and ASTM. We meet twice a year to work on new updates for the book, which involves committee members carrying out spike recovery testing protocols to confirm that new methods are valid, robust, and will stand up to scrutiny. We have just completed the 11th edition, which was officially published in January 2017, and you see an image of the front cover in the middle of this slide, and it includes new plasma spectrochemistry and, and sample preparation methods for heavy metals. Many standards organizations and federal agencies that set specifications and guidelines require the use of ACS-grade reagent chemicals in many of their testing procedures, including United States Pharmacopeia, the U.S. EPA, and ASTM. Let's specifically take a look at one of the organizations we work with, the United States Pharmacopoeia Convention. The use of ACS Book of Reagent Chemicals is referenced in three of the USP books of compendial standards. 
First, the USPNF is a book of public pharmacopoeial standards containing standards for drug substances, doses, forms, compounded preparations, and excipients. It is a combination of two compendia, the United States Pharmacopoeia, USP, and the National Formulary, NF. The current version of NSP, NF, is USP 41 and F36, which became official on May the 1st of this year and is designated by the FDA as the official compendia for drugs marketed in the U.S., which must conform to standards to avoid possible charges of adulteration and misbranding. USP also publishes two other books of compendial standards, the Dietary Supplements Compendium, DSC, which contains monographs, guidelines and reference tools relevant to the supply chain of dietary supplements and nutraceuticals. The third one is the Food Chemical Codex, FCC, which covers the verification, identification, quality and purity of food materials to ensure the overall safety and integrity of the food ingredient supply chain. It is important to understand that the USP creates and continuously revises all three standards through a unique public-private collaborative process, which involves scientists and industry, academia and government, as well as other interested parties from around the world. The ACS is one of those interested parties, so as a result, we have an important role to play in how the USP updates its book of compendial standards. As a result of this collaboration, the ACS Book of Reagent Chemicals is recommended in all three USP reference books as exemplified by this page from the General Notices and Requirements of the USPNF, which says, The proper conduct of the companion procedures and the reliability of the results depend, in part, upon the quality of the reagents used in performance of the procedures. Unless otherwise specified, reagents conforming to the specification set forth in the current edition of reagent chemicals published by the ACS shall be used. Similar wording is also used in the Dietary Supplements Compendium and the Food Chemical Codex. For that reason, we work very closely to make sure that ACS testing procedures and methods align very closely with those of the USP. So my work as the leader of the Elementary Impurities Task Force has given me a unique insight into how heavy metals testing is carried out in the pharmaceutical, food, and high-purity chemicals industries. And in particular, to meet our strict spike recovery testing protocols, a solid understanding of what analytical techniques are most suitable and what kinds of sample preparation procedures are optimized for the sample type and the workload. For example, we have representatives on our committee of large contract labs who will have a high volume of completely different sample matrices coming into their lab based on who their customers are. On the other hand, we have pharmaceutical manufacturers who might not have a high workload, but based on the risk assessment strategy, will be asked to analyze a wide array of samples, including APIs, excipients, fillers, and lubricants. Or perhaps someone in the QC department of a food company that has to measure a group of heavy metals in its diverse range of processed food products. And finally, we have corporate R&D people from the petrochemical industry who could be asked to identify or characterize a suite of unknown samples to troubleshoot a manufacturing problem. These are all examples of the day-to-day problems associated with people who serve on our committee. So with that background information, let's take a closer look at some of the different application examples carried out by SRC. Let's begin with a pharmaceutical application. For those of you who work in the pharmaceutical industry, you know that the USP has recently updated its 100-year-old heavy metals test with a modern plasma spectrochemical procedure. Let's take a closer look at the old heavy metals test described in USP Chapter 231. The test is based on a suite of heavy elements reacting with organic sulfur compound to produce a precipitate of the metallic sulfide that is then compared with a lead standard solution. It is used to demonstrate that the metallic impurities colored by the sulfide ions do not exceed the specified limit. One of the many drawbacks of this approach is the assumption that the formation of the sulfides in the sample is very similar to the formation of the lead standard solution and is not affected by the sample matrix. 
However, since many metals behave very differently, the method requires that the visual comparison is performed very quickly after the precipitate is formed. Unfortunately, analysts can differ in their interpretation of the color change, so they may not consistently read the sample the same way every time. Another limitation of the technique is that the sample preparation procedure involving ashing at high temperature and acid dissolution of the sample residue is prone to sample losses, particularly for the volatile elements like mercury. The loss of metals is also matrix dependent and because the procedures are time consuming and labor intensive, recoveries can vary significantly among different analysts. It can be seen here that different heavy metals produce a slightly different color or precipitate. So if they are all present in the sample, the color change is very difficult to estimate. Given all these issues, why did the test remain as an official test in the USP until January of this year, approximately 110 years after its introduction? The primary reason was because the industry did not have a globally accepted test to replace it. For all its faults, General Chapter 231 was well understood, routinely used by the industry, and was harmonized with the European and Japanese pharmacopoeias. The winds of change began with the publication in 1995 of an article in the Pharmacopeal Forum. In this article, it noted that 50% of the metals of interest were lost in the ashing process and that there was essentially no recovery for mercury. In 2000, Wang and co-workers made similar observations in an article in the Journal of Pharmaceutical and Biomedical Analysis, where he noted, although still widely accepted and used in the pharmaceutical industry, these methods based on the intensity of color of a sulfide precipitation are non-specific, labor-intensive, and more often than not, will yield very low recoveries. Then in 2004, Nancy Lewin and co-workers directly compared the recoveries of 14 different elements using USP Chapter 231 with ICPMS. Consistent with the other two articles, this study showed a number of recoveries around 50% and some of them less than 10% and no recovery at all for mercury as exemplified in the graph on this slide. Following this paper, the USP proposed three new general chapters to replace Chapter 231. Chapter 232, Elemental Impurities Limits. Chapter 2232, Elemental Contaminants in Dietary Supplements. And Chapter 233, Elemental Impurities Analytical Procedures. These revisions focused on two main areas of work. Updating the 100-year-old method to test for elemental impurities drugs and dietary supplements to include procedures that rely on modern analytical technology and also setting limits for acceptable levels of metal impurities in drugs and dietary supplements based on updated toxicology data. The USP put together an expert panel to get input from important stakeholders to, to assess new technologies and methodologies that would be usable across many different varied pharmaceutical laboratories. They agree that the limits for exposure should be based on the most recent toxicology data related to its potential health concerns. In addition, the analytical technology should be commercially available and relatively easy to use by non-experienced operators. These new chapters were intended to replace the existing methods in Chapter 231 for heavy metals. For comparison purposes, here are the permitted daily exposure levels in micrograms per day as defined in Chapter 232. These PDE limits are related to the toxicity of the elemental impurity and its bioavailability. The extent of exposure has been determined for each of the elemental impurities of interest for the three major routes of administration shown here, oral, parenteral, and inhalation. Note, the classification is based on the, of their toxicological impact, which is a combination of toxicity and likelihood of occurrence, with class 1 and class 2A elements, that's the first seven in this list, which are lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, cobalt, vanadium, and nickel, and are considered the most significant. It's also important to emphasize that this list of 24 elements was originally only 15 until the USP aligned its Chapter 232 with the ICH, which is a global consortium of pharmaceutical manufacturers in Europe, Japan, and the US. For your information, the original 15 elements are marked with an asterisk in this table. Let's take a closer look at Chapter 233. Chapter 233 describes two analytical procedures for the measurement of elemental impurities. 
Procedure 1, ICP-OES, and Procedure 2, ICP-MS. It applies to pharmaceutical materials described in Chapter 232 and dietary supplements described in Chapter 2232. It gives guidelines on sample preparation, instrument selection, calibration procedures, and validation protocols to validate the method. It doesn't mention anything about specific instrument operating parameters, but just says to use the manufacturer's recommended conditions. However, it also says that appropriate measures must be taken to correct for matrix-induced interferences in both techniques, such as wavelength overlaps in ICP and argon and matrix-introduced polyatomic interferences in ICPMS. So once a technique has been chosen based on the expected level of contamination in the sample, it has to be validated by going through the complete set of validation protocols, which might have to be shown to regulators if requested. The complete validation protocols, which cover a variety of performance and quality tests, include calibration drift, detectability, precision, specificity, accuracy, ruggedness, limit of quantitation, and linear range. But it should be noted that all spike recovery procedures described here have to be carried out before the sample preparation step. Chapter 233 states that the selection of the appropriate sample preparation procedure will be dependent on the material being analyzed and the suitability of the analytical technique being used. It gives examples of procedures which have all shown to be appropriate for both pharmaceutical and nutraceutical type materials, but is ultimately the responsibility of the person doing the analysis. The suggested procedures include analyzing the neat sample, direct aqueous dilution with either deionized water or a mineral acid, direct organic dilution with a suitable organic solvent, or indirect solution. This is used when a material is not directly soluble in aqueous or an organic solvent. It is preferred that a total metal extraction sample preparation be carried out in order to obtain an indirect solution, such as an open vessel dissolution or a closed vessel approach, such as microwave digestion, using concentrated mineral acids. If an indirect solution approach has to be used, it suggests using a closed vessel type digestion because it minimizes the loss of volatile impurities. The choice of what mineral acid to use depends on the sample matrix and the impact of any potential interferences on the analytical technique being used. The sample preparation technique should yield sufficient sample to allow the quantification of each element of the elemental impurity limit specified in Chapter 232 and Chapter 2232. So let's take a closer look at the capabilities of SRC technology to digest a wide array of pharmaceutical matrices. Many drug products are organic in nature, therefore the most efficient mineral acid to use is typically a strong oxidizing agent such as nitric acid. Unfortunately, nitric acid yields large amounts of CO2 and oxides of nitrogen when dissolving organic base samples. The microwave technology will therefore not only need to accommodate the high temperature required to, di to digest all the different sample types, but also be able to handle the subsequent increase in pressure produced by the generation of such large volumes of these gases. So a successful sample preparation depends on selecting the correct acid chemistries and obtaining a suitable temperature to properly extract the elements of interest and create a homogeneous and representative solution. The high temperature capability of SRC technology is exemplified by this plot of chamber pressure in blue and temperature in red. It can be seen that the sample has reached a pressure of 160 bar and a temperature of 280 degrees centigrade in approximately 20 minutes. Maintain at that level for 10 minutes and then cool back down um, in 15 minutes. The complete digestion process has taken about 45 minutes in total, which is fairly typical for most samples using this type of technology. One of the main advantages of SRC technology is that the digestion process for widely different samples can all be combined together in one simultaneous run as shown by the different color-coded samples loaded into the chamber. This has a significant impact on digestion efficiency and productivity. Since the base load of the chamber is monitored, the sample type inside each vial is almost irrelevant to the dissolution process.
It's also important to understand that the quality of the data generated by the ICP OES or the ICP MS being used is only as good as the sample solution being analyzed, which is directly impacted by how efficient and how complete the sample dissolution procedure is. So let's take a look at typical SRC sample preparation procedure using Chapter 233. The sample size is typically half a gram, but can be modified due to detection needs and sample homogeneity. 5 to 10 mils of nitric acid or a 4 to 1 nitric hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid mix is typically used and will work for many samples encountered in USP work. About 0.5 of a mil of hydrochloric acid will often help to stabilize some elements, particularly mercury and the platinum group elements. However, be aware that argon chloride polyatomic interference will interfere with monoisotopic arsenic at mass 75 if being determined by ICPMS. Hydrofluoric acid is needed sometimes to completely digest silicate material and several other elements including uh, titanium and tungsten. Osmium should be handled with caution as it oxidizes very easily to the volatile and toxic osmium tetroxide in nitric acid. Um, for this sample preparation, it is suggested to use hydrochloric acid or maybe some kind of alkaline fusion. Even though digestion temperature will vary based on sample matrices, most SRC digestions are carried out around 250 degrees Celsius. This table shows why temperature and pressure are so important and how it affects decomposition. The, the sample weight, acid mixture, volume, and digestion of the two active pharmaceutical ingredients are all identical. The only difference is the pressure and the achieved temperature. Let's examine the final solution of both digestion methods. The API sample on the left, label number one, is still dark yellow in color due to the higher residual carbon content. The oxidative digestion process was incomplete because of the lower temperature of about 180 degrees Celsius. It can be seen quite clearly that the sample on the right, label number two, which achieved a higher temperature of 210 degrees Celsius, has resulted in a more complete digestion. The bottom line is that if the sample is dark yellow, chances are that it still contains undigested organic material. This is important because high residual carbon content will potentially be problematic for the measurement of some elemental impurities by both ICP OES and ICP MS. This slide shows the residual carbon content of three different APIs. The first one is propranol hydrochloride, second one is primaquine diphosphate, and the third one is, is sulfmethoxalone. They have all been digested by traditional batch-based microwave in blue and SRC technology in orange. The SRC used 6 mil of nitric acid to, di to digest half a gram of the API, achieving a digestion temperature of 270 degrees Celsius. This produced a significantly lower residual carbon content compared to the traditional microwave approach that results in less carbon interferences when using ICPMS to measure the trace elemental impurities. D these data are taken from a recent Talanta paper by Muller and co-workers. This is a plot of residual carbon content against digestion temperature for three organic samples, a fish oil, a polyethylene, and a ginkgo biloba, which is an herbal supplement. It can be seen that the residual carbon content has been reduced to below 0.01% for both the polyethylene and the ginkgo, and less than 0.2% for fish oil at 260 degrees Celsius. The lower carbon content in the final solution is more desirable to reduce levels of carbon-based polyatomic interferences when using ICPMS. It's also important to point out that high residual carbon content not only impacts the severity of the carbon-based polyatomic interferences, but can also potentially clog the interface cones. In the left-hand column of the table, we see carbon-based polyatomic interferences cited in the literature which can potentially interfere with elemental masses shown in the right-hand column. Whereas on the right-hand side of the slide, we see an ICPMS sampler cone that has been blocked by carbon deposits building up on the tip after extended use and nebulization of organic-based samples. 
Let's now take a closer look at the validation protocols associated with Chapter 233. First of all, you have to understand that USP uses the term target limit or J-value, which is the concentration of the elements of interest properly diluted to the working range of the instrument. So all 24 elements in Chapter 232 will have J-values based on the permitted daily exposure levels, sample weight, and dilution factor of the final solution being analyzed. Let's take lead as an example. The limit for lead is 5 microgram per day. Based on a suggested dosage of 10 gram of the drug or the supplement per day, that's equivalent to 0.5 microgram per gram of lead. If 0.2 gram of a sample is digested and made up to 100 mil, that's a 500-fold dilution, which is 1 microgram per liter. So J for lead is 1 microgram per liter based on this dilution factor. Chapter 233 then says to run a calibration made up of two standards, 1.5J and 0.5J. So for lead, that's 1.5 microgram per liter and 0.5 microgram per liter. Instrument suitability is then assessed by measuring the calibration drift. The calibration drift is measured by comparing the result for standard one before and after the analysis of all sample solutions under test. The, the drift should be 20% for each target element. This is the first step to determine the suitability of the technique. A full suite of validation protocols should then be run. Three of the most important ones are described here. Accuracy. Analyze three samples spiked at 0.5, 1, and 1.5J. Acceptance criteria is the mean of three replicates of three spike recoveries should be between 70 and 150% recovery. Precision. Analyze six separate samples prepared and spiked at 1J. Acceptance criteria of the RSD should be less than 20%. And ruggedness, analyze 12 samples of 1J one, of one either on two separate days by two separate analysts or using two separate instruments. Acceptance criteria is the RSD should be less than 25%. Because all spiked additions have to be carried out before the sample preparation procedure, it's critically important that the microwave digestion technology used ensures that no analytes are lost during the digestion process and that no contamination is occurring from other samples in the run, particularly with the volatile elements which potentially could be lost if the microwave has to vent off the excess pressure. Here are some, here are some Chapter 233 representative data showing accuracy and precision for an IPA sample using the SRC and ICPMS. Sample weights of 500 milligram were digested in the SRC using only nitric acid and producing a residual carbon content of less than 0.025% in the final digest. The data shows a range of average spike recoveries for 15 elements of 94 to 108%, which are well within the Chapter 233 accuracy specifications of 70 to 150%. In addition, the average precision values are around 5%, well within the specification of less than 20% RSD. This table exemplifies heavy metals data for a fish oil capsule, the SRC digestion was 1 gram of sample in 10, 10 mils of nitric acid plus 1 mil of hydrochloric acid. A temperature of 240 degrees Celsius was achieved, held for 15 minutes, cooled, and diluted 100 gram with deionized water and analyzed by ICPMS. Note, SRC technology was able to completely digest and dissolve an entire Capsule, very difficult with a conventional closed vessel system. The top part of the table shows the duplicate results and LOQ in PPM for the capsule. The data in the middle shows percent spike recoveries of 5 ppm cadmium, 10 ppm lead, and 15 ppm arsenic and mercury spiked into the sample before digestion. The data on the bottom shows the percent spike recoveries of a laboratory fortified blank taken through the entire sample preparation procedure. It can be seen that all percent recoveries are well within the desired range. Let's now turn our attention to food samples. A food manufacturer or a contract lab that specializes in the analysis of foodstuffs typically utilizes many different analytical techniques to fully characterize food materials for the full suite of macro, micro, and elemental impurities. Whereas historically flame, flame and furnace atomic absorption were used to cover the wide range of elements in foodstuffs, often multiple sample preparation steps were needed to determine the full suite of elements. However, today plasma spectrochemistry is widely used for this type of analysis. 
Because modern instrumentation c- can cover such a wide elemental and concentration range, ICP-MS and ICP-MS are now being used to measure sub-PPB levels for contaminant elements like lead and arsenic, while at the same time measuring high PPM levels of elements like calcium and potassium. For that reason, it is important the sample preparation procedure allows the complete multi-element suite to be measured in the same analytical method. The digestion of infant formula is particularly challenging because it contains up to 10% protein, up to 10% carbohydrate, and up to 5% fat. The the majority of of elemental nutrients and minerals in infant formula are not particularly low and are easily covered by ICP OES. However, some elements such as iron and zinc are often present at trace levels and therefore close to the detection limit for the technique. So the ability to digest higher sample weights and make different sample dilutions means that ICP OES can typically be used for the full suite of analytes. An additional benefit of increased sample weight is that it allows a more homogeneous and representative sample to be taken. So let's examine the pressure temperature plot of infant formula by SRC. Similar to pharmaceutical samples, the higher organic content of infant formula will produce large volumes of CO2 and oxides of nitrogen during the digestion process, which will rapidly increase the pressure in the vessel. The large chamber size and pressure capability of SRC allows up to 2 gram of infant formula to be digested with 10 ml of nitric acid and 5 ml of water in a 40 ml vial. Temperature and pressure will spike due to the CO2 and oxides of nitrogen gases generated as organic material starts to digest. The benefit with SRC technology is that every sample has direct monitoring of temperature and pressure. It can be seen that at 135 bar pressure, a maximum temperature of 250 degrees is achieved. With 2 gram of infant formula, this would be very difficult with a closed vessel system. In fact, the maximum sample weight with a high pressure closed vessel digestion system is typically about half a gram. In this table, we see residual carbon content as a function of digestion temperature for milk powder. It can be seen that at 240 degrees Celsius, the residual carbon content of the 2 gram of digested milk powder is approximately 0.1%, which as previously mentioned is beneficial to reduce the severity of carbon-based polyatomic interferences in ICPMS and will minimize the clogging of the interface cones with carbon deposits. Various food samples require different temperatures and generate varying pressures during digestion based on their compositions as shown by these three pressure temperature plots based on their carbohydrate, protein, and fat content. For example, noodles are high in starch, milk powder is high in protein, and olive oil is high in fat. As you can see by the plots, the resulting pressure can vary from about 30 bar all the way up to about 60 bar. For these reasons, digestions of these types of samples require microwave technology which is flexible and and can accommodate these variable heating conditions. Even though a high-pressure rotor-based system will do an adequate job for these kinds of samples, the capability of SRC technology, which can achieve temperatures up to 300 degrees Celsius, is better suited because of the ability to digest mixed batches of samples simultaneously in a single run. Okay, so let's finally end up with with polymers, plastics, resins, and petrochemicals. These represent a broad a broad class of compounds with a tr- with a tremendous range of physical properties. While some of these compounds are relatively easy to prepare for sample analysis, most of them are very stable matrices and require extremely high temperature and pressure to achieve complete digestion, which can be difficult to achieve even with a conventional closed vessel system. Since these types of samples are principally organic in nature, they generate high pressure during the digestion process. Labs in these industries typically complement microwave technology with traditional dissolution tools like hot plates and power bombs to to digest these highly stable matrices. These techniques have their own set of challenges associated with handling large volumes of acids, contamination, lengthy digestion cycles, and exposure of the operator to acid fumes. Although multiple samples can be digested in closed vessel microwaves simultaneously, samples of similar matrices need to be batched in order to ensure complete control over the digestion process. This limits the productivity of a lab testing wide variety of sample matrices. SRC technology therefore offers a multitude of benefits as highlighted here. 
This slide shows a microwave digestion of high-density polyethylene at two different temperatures, 180 and 220. The sample size was half a gram dissolved in 10 mL of nitric. It can be seen quite clearly the sample on the left, which achieved a temperature of 180 degrees, still has small particles of, of undissolved HDPE floating around, whereas the sample on the right achieved a temperature of 220 degrees and has been completely dissolved. Okay, these data show two certified polymer reference materials, low-density polyethylene and an ABS polymer resin that were digested in the SRC using 0.5 gram a sample in 4 mL of nitric acid. The reaction chamber was pre-pressurized to 40 bar to prevent the acids from boiling, which subsequently prevented cross-contamination of loss of volatiles. The pressure and temperature were then ramped up to the levels shown in the top section of the table, cooled and diluted to 50 mL and analyzed for lead, cadmium, and lead by ICP OES. The certified values, together with the values found and spike recoveries calculated, are also shown in the bottom section of the table. Okay, the data generated by researchers at Dowd Chemicals show a comparative data between SRC digestion and the sulfated ash method for the analysis of a cation exchange resin. It can be seen that the sulfated ash method cannot detect many of the elements as indicated by the not detected ND in the column because of the high blanks resulting from contamination in the sulfated ash method. Using SRC technology, the number in parentheses show that the LOD was two to 10 times lower than the sulfated ash method as a, as a result of the much cleaner microwave digestion process. And if we look specifically at iron, which is a very important element to measure in cation exchange membrane, it can be seen that the detection limit is 12 times lower using the SRC technology, 0 0.042 ppm compared to 0.48 of a ppm. Okay, that just about wraps up my contribution to the webinar. But before I go and send it back to Laura, I'd just like to give a plug to my two books which I have written. On the left is Practical Guide to ICPMS a Tutorial for Beginners, and the one on the right is Measuring Element Impurities of Pharmaceuticals, a Practical Guide, which I've just uh, published. Further information can be found on my website address, and feel free to email me with any questions you might have. Thank you, Rob. Now that we've reviewed SRC technology and walked through some of the key applications, I did want to take a moment to touch on the SRC history. It was originally developed and patented by Milestone in 2006, with our UltraClave unit. Since then, we introduced the UltraWave in 2011 as a smaller benchtop model with added improvements, such as the ability to work with AquaRegia and HCL. We sold over 1,000 SRC systems globally with over 250 right here in the U.S. It's a very well-adopted technology, and we've been doing this for over 12 years now with a lot of happy customers. Some users have, been, have seen value in their first UltraWave and have even purchased second, third, or fourth instruments for their lab. The example applications that you see here are just a few, and thank you very much for Rob who highlighted some additional application areas. Laura gave a very good overview of milestones, so I won't go through this slide in great detail, but just to know that we are a global company with several locations throughout the world to support customers. So I think that about wraps it up. Thank you, Laura and Rob, for your informative presentation. It's now time for questions from the audience. As a reminder to those of you in the audience, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do that by typing it in the Q&A box, which you can find on the right-hand side of your window. And if we don't get to your question today, our speakers will follow up with you after the event. Okay, so let's look for our first question. Are there any limitations on the types of acids that can be used in the SRC unit? Okay, that's a good question. I'll take that one. Um, no, there aren't, actually, which is actually what sets it apart from some of the rotor-based systems who have limitations on some of the higher boiling acids, using a lot of those. You can actually use any type of acid. Um, you know, other units also suffer from not being able to use HCL, such as our ultraclave. Um, so with the, with the ultrawave, you can use um, HCL, aquaregia, um, any types of acid you want. So here's another question. This person says, we run very small sample sizes, and I don't want to dilute too much. Can we do that in the SRC? 
I'll take that one too. Um, yes. You can, and that's really a key feature of the ultra wave because we don't have to use a, a minimum volume to create enough vapor pressure like you do in rotor-based systems. You can actually use very tiny samples with a very small amount of acid in the smallest vial size, which would be in our 22 rack. And so you're, you don't have no minimum volume necessary, so you can accommodate the tiniest samples and limit your dilution factors. Good question. For USP compliance, is it important to get a complete digest? Okay, I think I'll take that one, Laura. Um, it is recommended in Chapter 233 that a total metal extraction is used. Um, so that's the preferred approach. However, it also does say that if a leachate extraction can be proved um, that it's scientifically validated that the metal dissolution is covered by a leachate extraction, that can be used, but it is recommended and suggested that a, that a total acid digestion is carried out. Thank you. Here's another one. This person says, we don't have an ICP MS, but I use an ICP OES for food analysis. Would the ultra wave be beneficial in this case? Uh, okay, Laurie, let me take that. Um, yeah, I mean, ICP OES is really well suited for this type of technology, mainly because in ICP OES, you can aspirate much higher dissolved solids. Typically, ICPMS, you have to keep the solids below about 0.2%, so you're limited um, of the dissolved solids capability that, that you introduce to the instrument, whereas ICPOES, you can, you can take 1, 2, maybe up to 5% dissolved solids. So, it, you, know, you're always, um, you know, you're always dealing with a much higher sample weight. So the benefit of SRC technology is that you can take higher sample weights. And um, as I mentioned in one of my slides about the food application, particularly um, milk powder, uh, infant formula, uh, they took two gram of sample and there's no way, and they introduced that directly into the ICP OES, there's no way you could int introduce that directly into the ICP MS. You'd have to make at least a tenfold dilution. If I'm digesting an easy and a hard sample, can I run them both at the same time? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yes, they can. Uh, in the SRC, you don't have to, to limit your program to a specific sample type. You can actually put the mixed sample types in there. If you know that one is going to be significantly more difficult, you just make that the program you use, and it'll be applicable to everything. So you just – we usually – do everything in the SRC with two basic programs, an easy one and a hard one. So if you have a mixture, you just use the more difficult program that accommodates um, both easy and difficult samples to digest. You said that sample prep method development would be easier. How is that possible? Yeah, that was on one of my slides. Um, I did kind of brush over that, so I'm glad you asked. Sample prep method development is so much easier with an SRC because Everyone who has a, another method for sample prep can understand this. You have to try different acid ratios. You have to try different sample weights. Um, and every single time you vary that, if you're in a rotor-based system, that's a whole run. You can't, you can't mix those things, those types of things in a rotor. With SRC, I can have one vial with half a gram and a mixture of acids. I can have another vial right next to it with a quarter gram and a different mixture of acids. And then I might have two other ones with different ratios and quantities. And I can run them all at the same time, see which one of them gives me the best digestion, and then that's the one I use for that sample type for now on. So it's easy to get everything done in one run in 45 minutes, what would have taken me probably an entire day to get done on a rotor-based system or worse yet, on a hot plate method. Excellent. Well, on that note, I think we should wrap up. Laura and Rob, thank you both very much for speaking today. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to thank everyone in the audience for attending and participating in today's event, and I'd like to thank our sponsor, Milestone, for making today's webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of next year. You'll receive an email from Spectroscopy alerting you when the webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. We hope to see you all next time. Goodbye.